support your local restaurant, cafe. You don't need to come to daughter-in-law. Go to your local Indian restaurant in your own suburb. Give them a chance to survive. Those small, independent, tiny-owned businesses, we need more support for them. As you probably know, most of those places are sole operator uh, businesses that did not qualify for any government grant. It is a new week on Dirty Linen, and to kick off the week, we are talking to Jesse Singh, restaurateur in Melbourne, in New York, in Santa Barbara. Jesse's got it all going on. Country Victoria as well, mustn't forget Kyneton. Uh, Jesse, welcome to the show. It's so great to have a chat to you. Thank you so much, Danny, for having me. Like they say, if you can make it in Kyneton, you can make it anywhere. They are always saying that, aren't they? I want you to take us far away from Kyneton to kick off this chat. I want to take. I want you to take us back to Punjab uh, when you were a boy. Tell us about life. Tell us what it was like. Life uh, in the village in Punjab is uh, very simple. Especially, uh, I come from a farmer family, so living on a farm, growing up on a farm, was a lot of fun. I mean, there was so much outdoor activity in farming, growing your own food, growing the crops that you make living off. On side, we had buffaloes and cows, uh, chickens, goats, you name it. It was a full-on uh, uh, farm life that I really enjoyed and a massive inspiration of my success from my childhood days. So what were some of your jobs when you were a boy? Uh, as a boy, the first job start four in the morning. Uh, it's time to, because you got to milk buffalo twice a day, sometimes three times. The cows are three times. Uh, buffaloes were two. So you basically get up four in the morning, uh, get buffaloes or waters and if, uh, grass or the food, and you help the family milk the buffaloes because uh, there's a multiple buffaloes you need to milk. Milkman, uh, milkman comes around 4.30 or 4.45 o'clock. So you have to have all the milk ready in a container for that. And so that would be the first job. Then afterward, you help mom or grandma making a lassi or yogurt for the day for the breakfast. Uh, soon the sun come up. I still remember before sun come up in summers before you get too hot, the whole especially the males, the uncles and dad, the, they will start heading out to the village. So, I mean, everyone in the kitchen got to have active to make a full breakfast from scratch. Uh, and the chore as a little boy or a little girl in a family, you have to help in the kitchen. So it's a big part of a cultural thing that you must help at home. So uh, education or study doesn't, it has to be on hold. I have to help day-to-day -day chores. So I still remember those days very clear milking the buffaloes, helping my grandma and mom in the kitchen, could be making yogurt, lassi, butter, making the dough. I mean, I, I knew how to make a, milk the buffalo, make the butter, yogurt, all those basic things before I turned 10. Right. Yeah, that's really amazing. Uh, and uh, uh, days off and uh, no school days, weekends, you're always in the fields helping uh, with the crops. And that was a fun part. And I remember uh, especially... We had a massive uh, home garden. Uh, that's uh, still today's a uh, thing in back home in Indian. If you live in a village uh, in a rural area, you have your own garden. That's where most of your food comes from. So the growing up with the seasonal food was a big part. Uh, it's not like a Western country. You see tomatoes and apple year round. If tomatoes were summer and that's it, there was no tomato for the rest of the year. Sure. It's, and it sounds like everything was really fresh as well, like really responsive to what was growing. It is. Like you basically, I still have very clear days. My grandma passed out recently. She was 103 years old. Whoa. Hearing her in my voice, can, yeah. Oh, can someone go pick up some tomato? Can someone go get me an onion? Oh, can you pick up some spinach? Um, she was a big fan of fenugreek. So fenugreek, we put in a roti in a bread to make a breakfast. And that was her, I remember, very favorite flavor around wintertime, September, October, November. And I remember so many times she would go, can you, she refused to use even a half day old fenugreek, spinach, fenugreek and mustard have to be freshly picked, cut it, chopped and made into a food. Yeah. So when she's saying, can you go pick it up? She's not saying, can you go to, go to the shops? She's saying, can you go out to the garden? <laughs> go out to the garden and get some. And you only meant to get enough for that time. 
So that's how, yeah, because remember, we didn't, ha- we, I mean, those days we didn't have fridge and freezers. Even till today, we have fridge and freezer. The electricity is not a part of daily life because you never know when electricity is going to go. It can go on for weeks. So people don't rely on their fridges and freezers. Everything is a scratch, even till today. Oh, you know, that just makes me think when you say freezers. Can you talk to me about the um, Indian ice cream and how that's made when you don't have a freezer? So uh, it's funny enough, the ice cream is come part of that part of the world, uh, mostly the Persian, the top part of India, wherever the water is freezing cold that comes off the Himalaya. So during the summer, when all the glaciers are melting at high above in Himalayas, all the water feed through. So Punjab means five rivers. So that's what Punjab is, means. So we have five rivers come through the Punjab and the water is freezing cold. So these molds are made out of aluminium, beaten up aluminium. And then you quickly go fetch a bucket from the river and you just dip the mold in and it freezes instantly. So that's how the Indian ice cream was made. Uh, I mean, if you look in, ice cream is not a new dish. It's a very old dish. It's maybe hundreds and hundreds years old. Uh, electricity is very nice after, so, I mean, after 1920s and 30s became a common household. But even in the third world, still it's not uh, that everybody has electricity or fridge or freezer. So still those techniques still get used to make ice cream. Or they will churn... The like if you look in, I remember like if you lived in a big city far away from the river, they will get a dry ice and put in the side of the bucket, and then there would be this little a pot inside, and they will churn it. They will churn that milk or so fast around the dry ice, it will freeze it instantly. So that's how you got done ice cream in the other part of the that part of the world where you didn't have instant access to the cold river. Yeah. So when you say dry ice, you mean like a big block of ice? Big block of ice. What they do, so there's a, just imagine there's a bucket in a bucket. So they will stuff dry ice between two layers of the buckets and create this instant freezer style thing. And they will put a churn inside. So it's churning. It's like a blender with the milk and blending and surrounded. It's both made by tin. So that's how the ice cream went to uh, cities. I still, today I see that, I say, yep, uh, all handmade energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that in Mumbai last year. Um, They were still doing it like that. It was incredible. Um, And uh, most of our Indian desserts are, our desserts are dairy-based. I would say 100% dessert are dairy-based. Basically, uh, the base is milk, not like Western uh, country where the base is so many different. So all Indian dessert could be ice cream, could be sweets, Everything's uh, uh, come out of milk, and especially we are from Punjab. We are known to be the the milk bottle of India, uh, and growing up with the buffaloes and milking for milk is another cash uh, earning that most people rely on. So it was one of my family too, because you get paid uh, every you know weekly. Where crop you have to wait three to five months to get paid for a crop. Yeah. Um, do you know what things are like in your village at the moment with coronavirus? Because I know it's really bad in India. It's very bad. Uh, life is in standstill. Uh, they've been in a lockdown, just got lifted, I think, two, three months ago. But cases has gone up so much. But we have to remember in India, we are, a poverty is a huge thing there. Social distancing is impossible as a, I mean, when I was, there was seven of us who grew up in one room. That's your bedroom, that's your kitchen, that's your everything. It's a, so that, those things are impossible to even think about having a social distancing or especially 1.5 meter rule. It's, you can't even imagine there, like people like, what do you, what do you mean 1.5 meter? There is no that space. So life is, people got hit really hard and, uh, uh, most people who lived on a daily wage, like daily income earners, their life has been put upside down. Uh, the silver lining of the thing, there's not much death in India, I guess, because people have really, really strong immune system. You have to remember that water is polluted, air is polluted, uh, food is bootlegged. There's so much bad thing happening. So people must got an immune system. They can like eat rocks. We have a, always a joke in the family, like... You know what I mean? You can chew a rock and digest. I 
like for me coming from Western country, I can't even drink water. I, I remember I had a, I, I had a very funny uh, life threatening story. Uh, and before opening a uh, horn place, we went to the India and we were going to test the Pani Puri dish. You know, the Pani Puri, the balls of happiness. So I waited till last minute because I knew I'm going to get sick, but I didn't want to be in a hospital in India. So the closest flight from India is uh, Bangkok, Thailand. That's about uh, about four hour flight from New Delhi. So last day, about four hours before, went out testing this few different uh, Pani Puri dishes in uh, old Delhi. And I knew I'm going to get sick. And and I didn't want to even swallow. I just wanted to put it in my mouth, taste it. Just like imagine tasting wine. I wanted to taste different sort of uh, water flavors they were doing. Because Pani Puris are, are tamarind water. It could be a rose water. It could be a spices. could be yogurt. And it all has tap water. So, and especially a real Indian food you can only find on the streets in all daily and there's no hyg- hygiene so really bad like for as a western point you will get sick no matter what the the old say of daily belly is very true so i remember i went to did i did it i went to four different places did tasting i did not even swallow a drop of water i spit it out but man soon i got sat in airline my stomach started growling and i got sick and i ended up in a bangkok uh, hospital Oh my God, Jesse! Remember a few days, yeah, yes. That's a bit traumatic. <laughs> so it is, and I'm just saying I've been thinking about all that and all that I've been thinking over the time. Like, wow, because people in India, especially poor people in India, eat this and drink this water or food 24/7. That's why they must have an immune system like crazy rock. So that's why there's not many death. And it's funny, only death happened in my area as a super rich people. Mm. Yeah, right. Wow. So that's the only best silver lining out of this, only, but it is uh, really bad. Uh, but the best part is in India, especially uh, temples uh, kicks in. Uh, most temples has been feeding people 24-7, mean there is free food 24-7, uh, cooked by community, gathered by community. So there is a lot of uh, people who are blessed. Uh, we all uh, contribute. And we send money back home. And uh, so there's a community kitchen that's been running and providing free food to a lot of people. Yeah, well, I think about that a lot. You know, it's, it's coronavirus certainly strikes people differently within countries, within cities, but certainly around the world. It's, um, it's not the same everywhere. And it's good to hear that at least there's one aspect of the Indian experience that, yeah, you can look to as as some sort of positive. But, yeah, yeah. Um, it is, and the biggest thing is uh, the the pollution. Pollution is totally gone. Yeah, that's radical. We can see the Himalayas in a mountain. And if you look in, that was the biggest news uh, a few months ago. You went in, like you could see Himalayas so clear that people haven't seen in thirty years. Yeah, that's crazy. Most uh, people who were t- who were about twenty years, like uh, I'm not even I'm not even kidding, Danny. Like any kid that were 22, 24 years old never even seen a blue sky in that part of the world, especially polluted city like Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta. They've been seeing clear blue sky since this lockdown. That's really amazing. Yeah, like a vision appearing, <laughs> appearing like a vision. Appearing, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, because all suddenly they were there for them. I remember I was talking to people in my family. They were like, horizon is so beautiful and so big because – they don't have much space. There's so much population. It's heavily built. So only way to find uh, some sort of like you have to look up to see the space. Like, wow, we live in a big place. Normally you don't feel that in India when you're in those big cities. Yeah. Well, Jesse, how did you come to be doing what you're doing? You know, you've, you've lived in Melbourne. You've lived in New York. You've lived in California. You've um, opened restaurants in all of those places. You're such a dynamic person in the Melbourne hospitality scene with um, your restaurant's daughter-in-law, Mrs. Singh, and Horn Please that you opened up prior. And now, yeah, you had the uh, interesting idea of opening a pub during a pandemic. We're looking forward to getting to Mr. Brownie when we're allowed to. Um, How did a little boy who got up at 4 a.m. to milk the buffalo before school end up doing what you are doing? 
Uh, I mean, we grew up, uh, my parents, grandparents, our motto was always work hard. And worked hard, came in, uh, because being born in a farm, farmer family, food was always a very, very big part of my life. And as you know, you will never meet a rich farmer, so does as a restaurateur. But this is something you fell in love with. This is what you look forward to. I mean, I live and breathe in restaurant. I spend more time in restaurant with my staff than my own family. Nights, weekends, day, holidays. And I, I, I am still, even like the coronavirus has gone through this whole year, raged us, uh, biggest affected industry would be hospitality and retails. I am still in so much love with my work. I love what I do. I love creating space. And I remember first me and my partner, uh, business partner, Jennifer, remember we're going in a Kyneton and that was a dream. We're moving from San Francisco. We said, well, why live in Melbourne? Let's go to a nearby a beautiful town. And with me and Jennifer, we created a small little place, Daba the Mill, in a country. You, I remember going to the farmers, picking, picking up a lamb and trying to learn how to butcher the lamb and a cow. And driving to Vic Market four times or five times a day. I, I felt so much enjoy working in and... And the people, I still remember one of my best friends, he's my best friend, uh, his name is Paul uh, in Kint, and he loved me so much, and he said, look, man, I really like you, I really love you guys, but you think it's a great idea to open an Indian restaurant in Kinton? He said, look, forget that Indian restaurant curry, people haven't even seen Indian before you, you you're the first Indian who living in this town. <laughs> so... But uh, soon we opened the door and I couldn't believe the amount of support we had from the community that like, wow. So we were open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And every day over the time, we knew who was going to come on Thursday. Uh, we knew which family will come on a Friday or Saturday. People invite you home. It became such a social life and a huge part of my life till today, those people. So... I truly love what I do, and especially Indian food is doesn't just belong to India. Curry belongs to, I guess, to the universe. It's one of those cuisine that no one can claim. Could be a British curry, could be a French curry, could be you go to West Africa, South, they have their own curries. Indians have their curry. So it's, a, it's a, such an international food. We, with the, my partner Jennifer, we wanted to try to create into a fun, funky, cool space. So either most of the ethnic restaurants either were done in a very low, cheery or very high end, like white tablecloth, very trying to be a, like a high end European cuisine, one plate dinner. But as you know, old word food is a very uh, family share, friend share, like you share with everyone. There is no such thing. You can create a, a dish, one dish in a plate. Curries come with the stew, the rice, the papadam, the chutney, the pickle. There's so much to it that is impossible to put on one plate. Well, I know that you really wanted to, I guess, change the reputation of Indian food. You know, with a lot of those old school restaurants, you know, there's there's 10 chicken, 10 lamb, 10 beef dishes. You know, the sauces perhaps are not um, made fresh. Maybe they use the same sauce for different proteins. I mean, you really had a vision to um, to resurrect Indian food in a way, didn't you? Or, to, or I guess, I suppose, to expand people's ideas of what it could be. Yes. And uh, because what happened when you go to India, like, Indian food is not what you eat here. As you know, you have traveled in India so well. You, like, biggest shock I see people, a lot of people, especially Australian, go to Thailand. They order Pad Thai. Pad Thai in Thailand and Pad Thai in Western countries, two, dif two different parts of the coin. Just like a sushi roll in Australia or America compared to getting a sushi roll in Tokyo. It's the exact same thing with Indian food. And... Uh, here, most of the Indian food, actually a menu and uh, the copy of the menu come from Britain, from especially from uh, 50s, 60s and 70s, Indian British restaurant that went all over uh, the world, especially being successful Chinese restaurant, because this is uh, the Chinese restaurant. They always had a very similar menu 
five to ten chicken, the lamb, the beef, the pork, the prawn, the fish is the same base with a few different things added into it. Some might have a different color, some might have a butter, some might have a cream. So that's what a lot of Indian restaurants got into that platform. So in, if you look in 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, ethnic restaurant in Australia and America, uh, Indian, Chinese, Thai, Vietnamese, Kambu, they all have very similar menu. They will all have 100 dishes. A lot of time you will go in there, can I get 42, 68, 93? And if you look in the kitchen, you see, wait a minute, there's only two people or one people working in the kitchen. This restaurant is such a small place. It's impossible to have that kind of menu. So basically, one dish being repeated 40 times. Then, then it becomes kind of a takeaway food where you're like, uh, just a, it's a takeaway. You, so my thing was when I wanted to do something, so we said, like, why can't be an Indian food? An ethnic restaurant would be any other restaurant where you have a one small page menu, highly local source, good ingredient. It's going to cost a lot of money, a lot of prep work. You have to cook from scratch. And that's the reason that you have only a one page menu because it takes so it consumes so much time and money to create even one page. So that's why I refuse to make 10 chicken out of one chicken and I secondly being in a western country butter chicken is one of the biggest selling dish butter chicken sells more than anything it, it is for me so that's why we start calling unauthentic butter chicken we say all right we're not going to use a butter because Indian food spices has so much flavor that you don't need a fat and oil to add flavor where compared to some European cuisine you need to have that butter flavor to give a flavor to a dish because it's such a small dish with only very few ingredients but in indian cuisine if you look in tomato ginger garlic onion then 30 different spices it already has so much flavor so don't need to add butter and cream to a dish so what do you put in your butter chicken without what's the what takes the place of butter in your butter chicken uh fenugreek so dry fenugreek leaves and fenugreek seeds uh, so what that does, uh, it thickens the sauce. It gives a beautiful buttery flavor. So that's a recipe. That's an ingredient in India has been used for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, if you ever had a fake maple syrup, uh, the fenugreek can give you so many better flavor. Uh, there was a very famous say uh, in Manhattan, uh, down in around in uh, I think ninety seven or ninety eight. All suddenly Manhattan's wake up smelling like a maple syrup. Three four days and everybody in the whole Manhattan was confused why the whole city smelled like a maple syrup. So across the street, across the river in New Jersey, this factory opened up and they were trying a new way to make a maple syrup and they used too much fenugreek. Cause the, and then whole, yes, the fenugreek is one of those uh, things you can use into those very flavorful buttery. So the only thing they were adding sugar to it. So, yeah, so butter chicken for us is uh, instead of frying onion, uh, you boil. So basically you make a puree of onion, tomato, ginger, and you cook it down. When you're cooking with the water, you're boiling, you don't need oil. And oil, ghee, and butter become really bad fat in Indian cuisine because you're cooking for so long it becomes a pure cholesterol that pure grease the oil you see and uh, in a traditional Indian food people don't use that like people think uh, in India you cook with ghee no ghee is a very expensive thing first of secondly ghee you add on a last minute to give a beautiful flavor and brings so huge uh, it's a, such a slow burning fuel 10 kilo butter doesn't even make a half a kilo ghee. So imagine the calories in there. And the way in India, most people did so much manual labor work. And that was a source of uh, uh, fuel to the body. Right. So it's pr prized fuel. Very exactly. And it's such a slow burning calorie, it can last you all day. So that's why people will, especially in a, a rural area, in a village people, people will have a half a spoon of uh, ghee on top of their food. So they that can help their body because most people in India, as you know, vegetarian or poor people don't get enough nutrition. The meals are not balanced. Uh, we are not known to eat green veggies. As you know, we cook everything. So there's other ways to find to keep your uh, daily thing going in your body. 
And secondly, the cuisine we see here in Indian restaurant, you will not find in India. Now might be because we now in India last five, seven years, since we have a big middle class, uh, we start seeing Western style Indian restaurants opening up in a big city, especially in Mumbai, Delhi. But even in a rural village, you still won't find a restaurant because everyone cook home, eat home. It's uh, one of those things. Food always being a big part of people's life. You don't cut corners. You don't cut time. People have three proper meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And it, it, it depends. It doesn't matter. You're poor, you're rich. Everyone will cook and eat at home those three meals. Nothing is on go. Like It's it's really interesting because you're sort of doing all these things at once. Like one of the things you're doing is educating people in Australia that, that don't know that aren't from India or don't know India very well you're educating us about what Indian food is or can be but at the same time you're it's you're not stuck in uh, this idea of authenticity or you're not you're not bound by tradition you're also being really creative and I guess yeah just um going going on your own path I think it's really it's really interesting I think so much um so much of the time people want cuisine to be one thing or they want culture to be one thing. Like it's very it's very reductive and, of course, culture is always shifting and people are always making it making it new. I mean, have you felt that sort of – have you felt that sort of push and pull as you've tried to um, take your, your style of Indian food um, around the world? Yep. And especially because, like we just said, there we don't have the restaurant culture. Yeah, we don't have the eating out culture, and most of the population are poor people don't even have money to go eat out. So all so there is no such thing authentic Indian food. The reason I am saying authentic Indian food is what my mom, my grandmother made for me growing up. So my mom dal didn't taste like my grandmother dal. Those were the two different things. And so a lot of people think that for us, that is authentic because we don't have recipes. We don't have books. We don't have set things. Uh, so I am a very big believer. There is no such thing, authentic Indian food. My, Because I give you an example of it. My grandma, my mom, my auntie, my sister, will give them a one dish, a dal. They will all make, to, it tastes totally different than what my mom made. So my I could go to my auntie's house and I will have a dal and roti. Believe me, I will not be satisfied what my mom made me the dal and roti in grandma. So that's what, that it is very true to, it is impossible to have authentic Indian food. So that's why, why I even lie. Especially, and secondly, we are, I am working and opening restaurant in Western country. So I need the most of the ingredients sourced locally. So this is the fun way to say our unauthentic Indian cuisine with cuisine that has so much, so many people put into this curry cuisine, yeah? It, you, it's unbelievable a matter influenced by so many. As in India, you know, India has been ruled by the Romans, the Mughals, the British, the Goan, the French, and everyone came in, brought something, and everybody went back home, took something. And so it is uh, such a big international cuisine. I mean, but if you think a chicken tikka masala is a British uh, national dish, it's not even an Indian national dish, it's in a British, you know, do you know what I mean? So it is a, it's a, it's a very, and you can go to restaurant to restaurant, especially, let's talk about a Melbourne Indian restaurant. Each dish will taste different in a different restaurant. So that's another, my belief, because we don't, there's no such thing, authentic Indian food. Authentic, authentic would be you eating at home what your mom is making or your grandma is making or your sister is making or your wife is making, because that's what they've been doing for 20, 30, 40 years. So moving away from that, I grew up in, so eating in a Western country, let's say in Melbourne, eating out, going to different cuisine, having different experience. That's what I added into my cooking. I wanted to have uh, something from British, something Italian, something French added into uh, in a cuisine. And uh, spices belongs to everybody. Yes, they might not use garam masala. They might not use 
coriander, but they do use cumin, they do use uh, coriander. It's, you know, it's a so it's a blend of the whole world together. As uh, I am a very big believer, the food brings us together. That's the only one dish, only one thing. You doesn't matter what religion, doesn't matter what political belief you have, doesn't matter what you think. Comes to the food. Food doesn't have that. Oh, uh, that it brings all us together. So being for me, calling my cuisine very cheeky, fun Australian way, unauthentic. Australian Indian cuisine. This is what I love, and especially then most Indian restaurant has been. You see normally picture of Taj Mahal, the uh, the old Delhi, the red napkin fold into flowers or tablecloth, or no atmosphere whatsoever, or done in a very very high end with a white tablecloth, very stuffy, very dark, playing tabla music. We wanted to break all that. We said we are going to be a restaurant. Just like any other restaurant, rather than the Indian restaurant. And when people saw that first, they got they loved it. Yeah. Well, it's I guess it, yeah, it, it, yeah. It was very inclusive and open and yeah, fun as you say. And yeah, it was a very yeah. It feels very Australian in a way, like it's or very Melbourne. Yeah. Exactly. So I remember we opening a restaurant in uh, Babuji in New York on East Village and the people were in shock to seeing they were like what do you mean? We this is an Indian restaurant Babuji? Even they are standing inside they still couldn't believe this is an Indian restaurant. Even even in New York till 2014 either Indian restaurant were very cheap and cheery dingy or they had a Michelin star restaurant there was nothing in the middle. So we come to that middle part where you feel cool. It's a nice playlist uh, there's a design there's a color there's a self-serve beer fridge there's a great cocktail list there's a good wine list a good food people were like what do you mean you start you serving sea urchin biryani they were in the shock oysters a prawns a tandoori prawns a fish so it was a, a lot of those dishes that we eat in a normal day in a western country wasn't done in ethnic food or wasn't done in that style and especially on the plating so it was a uh, people fell in love with it they were like wow i remember cauliflower manchurian is a very uh, okay there is a cuisine in india called indian chinese cuisine that no chinese ever heard of yet it is one of the biggest cuisine in india so there's a man the name is manchurian that's the name of the cuisine the the style of the dishes it's very wet and soggy got soy sauce chili garlic and then it added indian spices into it it could be garam masala cumin coriander so come and remember we made in addition a cauliflower and we were like normally manchurian is very wet and soggy dish so we say well, no let's uh make dish into a crispy cauliflower dish i remember and we made this cauli crispy cauliflower uh, Manchurian dish, and it took New York by surprise with that and ice cream. <laughs> it was uh, people like, wow. Yeah. I know at Bubba G in New York, you had like queues around the block. It was an absolute sensation, was reviewed very favorably, and yeah, it was it was just like the hot restaurant in New York. Um, Jesse, I think we better talk about the pandemic just a little bit um, and how it's affecting you and your restaurants. And I want to, I want to ask you how you've brought this attitude uh, that, you know, that you've had, you've carried through your whole life. Like how has your attitude carried you and your people, your restaurants through the pandemic so far? How, what's your approach been? Well, my growing up in a family, especially born, raised in third world, seeing a poverty firsthand, these kind of events actually make you stronger. I reminded me who I am, where I come from. It is such a hard time where people in Australia, especially in Australia, probably never seen these kind of hardship ever. Where me, I grew up in India. I survived this couple civil wars, uh, bomb blast, curfew. This was a part of a normal life. I remember m going to mom like we want to go to now and go watch a cinema. And I remember then mom or grandma, some will be joking, you don't want to get blown away. No, you can't go to movie because suicide bomb was very normal. 
like people, terrorists were blowing up in buses, trains. Sin movie theater was one of the biggest place. In those time, India didn't have a mall uh, other than movie theater was a big part. As you know, Bollywood is a huge part of Indian culture. And terrorists attacked a lot of movie theater because they knew there's so many people go there. So casualty could be big when there's someone going to blow up. And I still have those word like a lot of the curfew memories came back during this lockdown. Uh, most of my childhood was like we had so many curfew after curfew. And when curfew mean in India, when I say curfew, mean curfew, mean curfew, mean no one allowed to leave home for nothing. No such thing. You can go for essential. You can go to grocery. You can go for walk. There's nothing. If you had no food, good luck. No food. You just can't not go outside. I, I still remember at nighttime, families going to other families to look for things, get a sugar, a flour, or just to live off of something basic. Uh, you weren't allowed to go work in your field or your garden, nothing. You just curfew me and it's just totally locked down. So, and uh, growing up in that, and I knew, I seen it, how a family survived, how we survived, and... It's best thing come up from that that everyone got together. They always would temples will always would be allowed to cook meals, so then people can just go and get your food. And it was a you didn't felt like you were rich or poor. You felt like you were you just like everyone else, just like today. In this uh, thing, I feel like I am just who I am. And first thing we did we wanted to know we wanted to make sure our team as you know most of my team here are either indians or nepalese or sponsor employees from could be anywhere or travelers mostly from european countries and they all got stuck here left behind no support from government from state local fed governments nothing and especially imagine if you are from india or nepal or you from other country that got shut down and mostly were like if you look in very beginning it was spain italy france india china they they the one got hit really hard even in the first wave country closed the borders everyone got stuck here then have no money most of these people survived on working on a minimum job like the jobs no one else wants to do and then all suddenly the jobs got stopped they have no backup no money no support where it was very hard but we quickly got together we want to make sure Everyone had a food, everyone had shelter because we knew these guys don't have income. So we said, look, you get kicked out. Just make sure you let us involve you. Most everyone most welcome. Come sleep in my house or restaurant, use a car. We'll keep having a job. So we kept our restaurant open, especially daughter in law. So just to have that 14, 15 jobs going, most of these people were had no support from any government whatsoever. And actually, uh, it was the best thing. Everyone had a purpose. Even I had a purpose to go to work, even as a lockdown. It, it wasn't about making money. It wasn't about profit. It wasn't about numbers, cancellation, uh, specials, all done. It was just, all right, guys, we just in this together. Let's just survive. And we used to have a lot of doctors and nurses, medical staff that come uh, came from St. Vincent or Peter McConnell or Royal Melbourne. And I remember a doctor reached out to me, asked me if I wanted to do a contract and feed staff. I'm like, yeah, we will, but I, we don't want money. We'll do it for, that's, you know, it's a, a part. These guys working so hard, we I would, they, it would be honor for to cook for them. But he, he go, but no, Jesse, I'm I'm asking in hundreds. I say, yeah, I know, hundreds. I know if you're asking me to cook for a whole uh, department, ED department, I knew there's going to be at least 40, 50 people per shift. So that's not a big deal, especially we are we are chefs. We cook. We know how to cost food. And dal and rice, a big two curry stew doesn't cost much money compared to a lot of the cuisine. And uh, so we've been since cooking for our, our doctors, nurses, medical staff, doesn't matter who. And it just, uh, for me, I think for me, I'm paying it back. That's what my belief is. As a community in Australia, especially in Melbourne, Victoria gave me so much. All my success belongs to Melbourne. I am successful because of Melbourne, Victoria, Kyneton. And I am, I've been trying to give it back. 
or share back what uh, I have. So that's my belief is, and especially we, I come from Sikhism, uh, from Sikh religion. It's a part of our religion. You must donate 10% of your earning every month. And I'm a big believer of that. I mean, you must share your, what you earn. It, it, this is what brings us uh, uh, together. And I'm especially, I'm very, very thankful to uh, Australian community, especially Melbourne. This is my favorite city. This is why I call it home. That's why I chose Melbourne over New York, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, Miami. Anyway, I lived in the best part of the planet. Till today, no one can beat what Melbourne is. So, Jesse, Melbourne is waiting to reopen. You know, we heard from the uh, – I'm talking to you on Sunday. We heard from the Premier this morning that, you know, we might need to – well, we, uh, we're going to open on the 2nd of November, but, you know, we're not sure if we're going to open a few days earlier. We sort of – we know we're almost there. How are you feeling about the future? The f- Yes, look, uh, like you said, we all in this together. You know what I mean? This is a pandemic. If we there's a bigger thing right now we have to worry about than me. I'm not concerned about uh, trying to open and lose a job or a restaurant. I have started so many times from a rock bottom. So if this is one more time I have to start it, so be it. And we're just uh, like everyone else. We're just waiting. And my only time I get stressed when I, a lot of these young kids, a lot of my employee staff comes to me and I look on their face. They are so disappointed. Like today, they were more disappointed than me, yet they don't even own a business. They just work there. They, it was like their soul has been broken because there's so many people relying hospitality and retail to open so they can have a job back. Because we still have to remember a lot of these people are not getting paid even a penny. They are not earning anything. They're living off credit. They're living off... They, they are just surviving. They are scratching things from here, there. And I felt so... I, I, I didn't care if either uh, Dan Andrews allowing me opening or not, but when I came to see my team and they were there and I looked in the... I can see through their heart and soul. And it was like they... It's, it was a shattered uh, uh, soul. They were like, oh, man, they've been now another week without a pay. Oh, there's no more work. How am I going to keep going? And a lot of these kids are, have still have students or feces, uh, particularly new a uh, few students. Their feces actually, their feces has been increased by ten to fifteen percent. Even they are studying from home. I know this. This fact that the international students still have to pay fees, and and most of them are on payment, like it's direct debit. So it's like not only pay their fees got jacked up fifteen percent. Yeah, it's just it's a it's really it's appalling. They're not even going there. I know it's really. It's really bad, yeah, and that's and they don't have that money. And uh, yeah, so we've been helping. Yeah, it, it's me, my partner. We just we told out like guys, reach out. Doesn't matter. We will do our best. You need a fees. Fees still need to go because if they don't pay fees, they become undocumented here. They need to leave. They it's a breach of their visa. So we uh, say, look, guys, don't worry about it. Here's the money. Just take it. Pay your fees. Just stay up there. Once things open up. We'll have rest of the years to, for you to pay us back. And uh, so it was uh, 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 for me as a business owner, again, there is no plan. I wish uh, Dan Andrew would say, guys, look, I'm sorry. We still not sure what's going on. As you know, this is a pandemic. I might open on a Wednesday if we only have. Like, obviously, they have the data, yeah, they have the model, they have numbers in mind that they can only open if those numbers or that thing's there. S- giving a business, they're still not giving a, 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 a small business a clear plan, what plan is. It would be great to, if you would said, look, guys, Wednesday we can open, or November 1st we can open if case stays under 5, 10, 17, 15, whatever the number, the doctors and scientists come up with it. And... Uh, in one way, I wish we should be preaching, okay, guys, this is the virus. We need to learn how to live with it. So there's going to be opening. There's going to be shut down. If we think there's not going to be a further shutdown, you would be living in false life. There will be future shutdown. There will be future outbreaks. It's impossible to uh, manage uh, this virus. Jesse, there are so many restaurants in Melbourne and 
restaurants are not dealing with this or experiencing this or feeling the situation in the same way. It's it's different for every restaurant, even if you think about someone who's lucky to have outdoor dining and someone who's, you know, in a basement and it's impossible. Tell us um, what you think about that and how, how this pandemic is striking people in different ways. The hardest thing is going to be Melbourne CBD. As you know, Melbourne CBD has so many little restaurants, could be basement, could be first floor, could be top floor. Most of them don't have outdoor seating. Most businesses are owned by ethnic immigrants at communities uh, that work so hard. Mum and Pop's restaurant probably don't have a great source of uh, knowledge of the rules and laws and grants. Um, so I think it's going to be a lot of death warrant for a lot of these guys who made this city most livable city in the planet world, especially as you know, Melbourne is known for international cuisine. International cuisine is happened because of these mom and pop operator it could be Chinese, Indian, Thai, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Africans. And there's a fair share of those people who own and operate business in Melbourne. I mean, if you look in, uh, I just, I'll talk about a little Burke street, Swanson street, Elizabeth street. Most of these business survived on a sheer volume of people who came to CBD. But we don't see that's going to happen. As you know, the government has not going to open up for the workforce to return maybe for another year. I feel like there's rarely any support. Let's not forget Melbourne got hit hard from last December when we had a bushfire right after Christmas. So the whole christmas was wiped out the whole january february was wiped out you i probably you remember remember those days when cbd was full of smoke for days and weeks there was so much there was so much anxiety in community there was so much bad going on it was so we've been suffering since last december the whole hospitality industry got hit really hard and we haven't heard anything from state fed or city uh, uh, of a mere Sally Cap, I haven't seen it uh, even those things. Then we got shut down in the first lockdown. I, you and me, I don't know if you recall the conversation we were having. I was putting a petition, emailing them in March, like, hey, whenever we allow to open, we know around the world that people are allowing more outdoor dining, start helping come up with the uh, plans. I have reached out to Mayor Sally Cap office, the business, this and that. No one even bothered to return my emails till today. And yet, all suddenly, now they're all scrambling for outdoor dining. And still today, we have applied for all those plans and permit, this and that. City of Melbourne still have no clue. They are just like, okay, we'll, we'll get back to you. There's no policy. There's no clear plan. Uh, they're putting apocalypse in uh, CBD right now but seems to be it is going to only few blessed uh, businesses, few well-known restaurants. Uh, so that's, again, I think there's a massive discrimination happening there to the small unknown operators. Uh, Click for Vic was another failure of 8 to $10 million got donated to this website from a taxpayer-funded money. None of that money made it to any immigrant own business or small business owner or people who are not into PR, who's not known, none of that money going to help them. So there's a lot of money getting thrown away, but it's not reaching out to the right people. So I, and I'm pretty sure if they get left behind, it, they will get left behind for the rest of their life. It's going to impact them so hard. As you know, most of these people probably work so hard in their own business for years and years, it would be impossible for them to restart it. So it's going to be, it's going to be bad for many, many operators, especially in Melbourne CBD. And hopefully there's an election coming up. We get a better mayor who will think out of the box for at least a year, two years, because we will need a strong leader in Melbourne, a mayor that can fight with a premier and a prime minister, get a fight for everybody not just for a very few uh, specific people. I'm very worried about, because I know a lot of immigrants. I am immigrant. I am one of those ethnic person. I've been blessed, but there's so many people that are going to left behind. And it's going to be heartbreaking to see them, their life earning. There's a little cafe across the street from me. Uh, this is a Turkish couple in front of a daughter-in-law. Man, they are there from, they get to their business five in the morning. They don't leave till five in the evening. Seven days a week, they sit empty. But, I every time now I look in their eyes, there you never will 
And you can never imagine they, these people's souls will get broken even they've been operating seven days a week without a single customer. But every day, every week goes by and you can tell, look in the eyes that these guys are like their souls are broken. It, it's it's going to be really, really hard. And we're very thankful. Hopefully, Melbourne communities are going to get together. And once we re allowed to open, people are going to come in. Hope my message to everyone, please honor your reservation if you're going to reserve. Don't do no show. We learned in the first, after first lockdown, people didn't even bother to ring you, didn't even bother to call you, that we could not come in, we're not going to show up. And if you're only allowed to have 10 people or 15 people, those chairs matter too that each chair create income for so many people in that restaurant. And Yeah, no, no shows are absolutely forbidden. <laughs> that is not okay. And I think, Jesse, it's also really important that people support the lesser known restaurants. You know, as you say, every business has a story, every business um, – has to navigate its own path through this. And you also bring up such interesting questions around representation. It's certainly something I plan to tackle on Dirty Linen in the weeks and months to come. Um, yeah, please, my message to final message would be support your local restaurant, cafe, for them to survive. Don't chase CBD. Don't chase those hat restaurant or turban restaurant. You don't need to come to daughter-in-law. Go to your local Indian restaurant in your own suburb. Give them a chance to survive. Remember, if they not, they they are the most business we need to survive. Those small, independent, tiny owned businesses. We need more support for them, as you probably know. Most of those places are sole operator uh, business that did not qualify for any government grant. So please support your neighborhood, your local place, before you come out look for another places. Thanks, Jesse. Really, um, really important words. Um, I just want to finish with one thing that I'll never forget that you told me when you were in Kyneton, you were introducing Kyneton to your style of Indian food or perhaps Indian food in general, and that there were some people there who were scared to say samosa. <laughs> so it, instead, they what did they ask for? <laughs> Do you remember what you told me? Uh, the veggie pasty. Uh, yeah. They yeah. say yeah. spicy pasty. pasty. <laughs> <laughs> spicy pasty veggie pasty it was funny they they and we would i mean we were trying like some people generally they knew what samosa was but some knew what they would be just it was out of their comfort zone so they will come for a spicy pasty that crispy spicy pasty <laughs> that my am i i always say if you can make it in that small little town people never had to forget about having them indian food they never even seen indian i i done that not only I lived there, I opened a business there and it was a very successful business in that community. Well, it's going to take more than a pandemic to stop you, Jesse Singh. Um, thank you so much for sharing some great stories today and some fighting words for Melbourne restaurants. Um, really love it. Love your restaurants. Can't wait to be back in them. Um, but yes, I will, I will obey you and support my neighbourhood restaurants first. But thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.